our soft chalk lesson for unit two, lecture four, is going to deal with how bacteria become resistant to our chemical agents, such as antibiotics. In the previous soft chalk lesson, we saw how antibiotics work or how they affect bacteria, their modes of action. And in this soft chalk lesson, we'll look at the mechanisms by which bacteria become resistant to those antibiotics. So let's start by looking at our fundamental statements. Most bacteria become resistant to antibiotics by way of one or more mechanisms that are coded for by genes in either the bacterial chromosome or bacterial plasmids. Bacterial genes may code for production of an enzyme that inactivates the antibiotic. Bacterial genes may code for an altered target site receptor, such as an altered ribosomal subunit or enzyme, uh, to reduce blocking of the antibiotic. Bacterial genes may code for altered membrane components that prevent entry of the antibiotic into the bacterium and or use efflux pumps to transport the antibiotic out of the bacterium. Bacterial genes may code for modulated gene expression to produce more of the bacterial enzyme that is being tied up or altered by the antibiotic. When under stress from antibiotics, some bacteria switch on genes whose protein products can increase the mutation rate within the bacterium, causing hyperevolution to increase the chance of forming an antibiotic-resistant mutant that's able to survive. Horizontal gene transfer as a result of transformation, transduction, and conjugation can transfer antibiotic resistance from one bacterium to another. And horizontal gene transfer enables bacteria to respond and adapt to their environment much more rapidly than mutation by acquiring large DNA sequences from another bacterium in a single transfer. Another mechanism that protects some bacteria from antibiotics is antibiotic tolerance, whereby the tolerant bacterium, called a dormant persister, is not killed, but simply stops growing when the antibiotic is present. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that more than 2 million people in the United States get infections that are resistant to antibiotics, and at least 23,000 people die as a result. And now let's look at our detailed learning objectives for this soft chalk lesson that you'll need to know for the exam. Name two bacteria that have low permeability membrane barriers and are thereby intrinsically resistant to many antibiotics. Briefly describe four different mechanisms occurring as a result of genetic changes in a bacterium that may enable that bacterium to resist an antibiotic. Describe our plasmids and state their significance to medical microbiology. State what the following stand for, MRSA, VRE, CREs, ESBLs, and XDRTB. And finally, define dormant persister and antibiotic tolerance. So looking at ways in which bacteria become resistant to our control agents, first of all, some bacteria have what are called low permeability membrane barriers. Uh, they've always had these membrane barriers that don't let things in very well. And so we say these are intrinsically resistant to many antibiotics. And examples of that include bacteria like Pseudomonas aeruginosa that has very low uh, permeability membrane barriers. And of course, Mycobacterium tuberculosis with its acid fast cell wall and species of Entracoxi. So these bacteria have always been resistant to a great many antibiotics just because they're basically born that way. They have low permeability membrane barriers. Now even those can become more resistant through mutation and genetic recombination. But most bacteria don't have these low permeability, membrane permeability barriers, but they become resistant to antibiotics as a result of mutation or genetic recombination. And of course, we talked about mutation and uh, genetic recombination or horizontal gene transfer in a previous soft chalk lesson.
So again, we're not concerned with the mechanism mutation or the mechanism of horizontal gene transfer here. We want to see what changes in the bacteria because of the changes made in the genes due to mutation or horizontal gene transfer. And there are four mechanisms of resistance that we're going to look at. We'll take up each one of these in detail. And again, all of these mechanisms are coded for by genes either in the chromosome or in plasmids or both. So here's the four methods we'll eventually be looking at. Producing an enzyme capable of inactivating the antibiotic, altering the target site receptor for the antibiotic to reduce or block its binding, preventing the entry of antibiotic into the bacteria and or using an efflux pump to transport the antibiotic out of the bacterium. And finally, modulating gene expression to produce more of the bacterial enzyme that is being tied up or altered by the antibiotic. Now to get us started on the importance of antibiotic resistance to society, uh, I have a few publications listed here, mainly from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, that you can read through if you wish. This first one, published in 2019, uh, looks at some of the real antibiotic resistant threats uh, for resistance in the United States. And we're not going to go through this whole thing, uh, but if we go down here, here's a little table that tell you uh, what CDC considers as urgent threats, uh, some of which, of course, we talk about in this course. Uh, serious threats, whole list of those, concerning threats, and a watch list. So there's a fair number of bacteria we're quite concerned about because of antibiotic resistance. And we'll look at a few of these at the end of this soft chalk lesson. And this becomes especially significant when we're looking at healthcare associated infections or HAIs. So as we see in the highlighted area here, healthcare associated infections, which are infections patients get while receiving medical treatment in a healthcare facility, are a major and yet often preventable threat to public safety. And on any given day, about one in 25 hospital patients has at least one healthcare associated infection. And this goes with what we talk about a lot in lab too, these healthcare associated infections. Uh, in a 2011 study, there was an estimated 722,000 healthcare associated infections in US acute care hospitals, and about 75,000 patients with healthcare associated infections died during their hospitalization. And these are the big ones we talk about really a lot during this class, the infections people get while receiving medical treatment. Uh, the two biggest ones are pneumonia. As you see here in this particular study, there's uh, over 157,000 cases of that. And surgical site infections from any inpatient surgery, again, about 157,000 cases of that. We also have gastrointestinal infections, about 123,000. That's mostly Clostridioides difficile, which we've talked about a few times and we'll mention down below. Um, then we have urinary tract infections, often associated with catheterization, around 93,000. And finally, septicemia or primary bloodstream infections, about 72,000 cases. So again, those are the big eight, uh, healthcare associated infections we stress. Uh, wound infections, including surgical wound infections, um, urinary tract infections, pneumonia, gastrointestinal infections, and bloodstream infections. And this can be quite significant. If we take a look at this article here, and again, we'll just look at some highlighted areas. Each year in the United States, approximately 2 million persons become infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria and at least 23,000 persons die as a direct result of these infections. And more, many more die from conditions complicated by resistant infections. And there's a lot of problems that occur because of this inappropriate use. As we see, inappropriate antibiotic use contributes to excess 
healthcare costs, promotes more antibiotic resistance, contributes to preventable adverse drug reactions. In fact, antibiotics cause around 142,000 adult emergency department visits annually for adverse drug reactions. And almost four out of five of these are for allergic reactions, often associated with antibiotics. And that also uh, contributes greatly to the Clostridioides difficile infections, uh, which we'll talk about in a few places. And then we have the costs. In 2009, about 10.7 billion was spent on antibiotic therapy in the United States, uh, including 6.5 billion, 3.6 billion, 526.7 million in outpatient, inpatient care, and long care, uh, care settings, respectively. But here's the main thing. The cost of antibiotic resistance to the U.S. economy is an estimated $20 billion annually in excess direct health care costs, with an additional $35 billion in lost productivity. So again, the excess of health care costs as a result of antibiotic-resistant infections and the lost productivity of the people who aren't working because they're being hospitalized uh, counts to many billions of dollars. And here's some common examples. An estimated half of antibiotic prescriptions given during pediatric ambulatory care visits are inappropriate. So that's someone just going in uh, with an infection to a doctor's office and being prescribed an antibiotic. About half of those prescriptions are inappropriate. And over one quarter of adult prescriptions are for conditions which antibiotics are rarely indicated. And again, it's not just limited to outpatient settings. There's a lot of problems that occur um, even with inpatients, especially in two cases, urinary tract infections in patients without indwelling catheters and treatment with intravenous vancomycin. Now, one of the prime examples is visits for acute respiratory tract infections. This leads to more inappropriate antibiotic prescribing than visits for any other group of diagnoses. An example of that, antibiotic treatment for acute uncomplicated bronchitis is not recommended. Most bronchitis is viral. And despite decades long widespread efforts to curb antibiotic prescribing in two, uh, 2010, 70% of all outpatient visits for this condition uh, acute uncomplicated bronchitis resulted in an antibiotic prescription. And another very common example is pharyngitis. Only 5 to 10 percent of pharyngitis or sore throat cases among adults are caused by group A beta streptococci, the only sore throat that requires antibiotic treatment. Yet antibiotics are prescribed for about 60 percent of ambulatory care visits for adult pharyngitis. And in addition to the problem of overuse, antibiotic selections are often inappropriate. Prescribers often choose second or third line antibiotics, which are typically broad spectrum drugs, which remember kill more microbiota and cause problems, including C. diff infections, despite established clinical practice guidelines recommending more target agents. So those are a few cases of uh, indiscriminate use of antibiotics. And finally, the uh, World Health Organization has published a list of bacteria for which new antibiotics are urgently needed. So worldwide, this problem of antibiotic resistance uh, is increasing. So now let's look at the mechanisms for resistance. When a bacterium gets new genes because it's obtained a plasmid or new genes because of changes in the chromosome, what's actually changing in the bacteria that allow it to resist that antibiotic. Well, it's fairly simple. Pretty simple things are happening here. They're kind of common sense if we visualize them with the animations and such. So one very common mechanism is the bacteria may produce an enzyme that inactivates the antibiotic. There may be a new gene in a plasmid or a new gene in the chromosome that codes for a new enzyme that's able to degrade the antibiotic or in some cases, 
uh, they can add chemical groups to the antibiotic. Now, an example of degrading the antibiotic are the beta-lactam antibiotics. Penicillins, monobactams, carbapenems, cephalosporins, these are known chemically as beta-lactam antibiotics. As we see in figure two, this shows you a general drawing of a penicillin, a cephalosporin, and an imipenem, three different beta-lactam antibiotics. Now, these are all chemically different. You don't have to know chemical structures, of course, but notice that all three of these are different chemically. They're made by different organisms, and yet they have one thing in common. They all have this little square right here, which in organic chemistry is called a beta-lactam ring a little carbon ring that has an oxygen and a nitrogen in it. And so they have that in common, although they're different chemical compounds made by different organisms. And the way bacteria typically become resistant to these is they produce beta-lactamases, enzymes that split that beta-lactam ring and inactivate the drug. So if we look at the arrow here, that's where the beta-lactamases can split that ring, which changes the whole shape of the drug and inactivates it. Now, one of the things done sometimes to overcome this is that sometimes these beta-lactam antibiotics, things like amoxicillin, tigracillin, imipenem, or ampicillin, these are beta-lactam antibiotics, are combined with beta-lactamase inhibitors like clavulinate or tazobactam or sulbactam. So the clavulinate we see down here in figure two, this is a um, chemical that resembles a beta-lactam antibiotic, but it's not an antibiotic. But what it does is it ties up the beta-lactamase enzymes, so they're not available to break down the beta-lactam antibiotic, and in essence neutralizes the beta-lactamases. And we have a group of antibiotics uh, listed on our antibiotic chart to kind of show that. So I have to right click on that. Uh, so if we look at this group, um, these are the antibiotics that inhibit synthesis of peptidoglycan synthesis causing osmotic lysis. And here's examples where they're mixed with beta-lactamase inhibitors. So for example, augmentin is a combination of amoxicillin, a beta-lactam antibiotic that inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis, and then clavulinate, which is a drug that uh, inactivates the beta-lactamase that would break down the amoxicillin. Uh, Tementin is ticercillin plus clavulinate. Unison is ampicillin plus solbactam, et cetera. So we do have a number of these uh, cases where these beta-lactam antibiotics are combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor uh, for those bacteria that might be breaking down the beta-lactam antibiotics. And unfortunately, sometimes when I click out of the page, it uh, becomes increased in size, so I had to reload it there. So anyway, those are the beta-lactamases. They break down beta-lactam antibiotics. Sometimes beta-lactamase inhibitors are added so that they don't break down the beta-lactam antibiotic. But then as these are used for a while, bacteria become resistant to the beta-lactamase inhibitors. And then you have to try a new beta-lactamase inhibitor. So it's a constant battle between the microbe and the drugs we're using. And in some cases, uh, what happens is that the um, bacteria add a chemical group to the antibiotic. They don't split the drug, but they add a chemical group. But that, again, inactivates the drug. So here's our animation of the first mechanism, bacteria producing an enzyme that inactivates the antibiotic. So again, the idea is that there's now a new gene in the chromosome from mutation, uh, or it's picked up a plasmid from horizontal gene transfer, and that can code for a new enzyme, shown as the green circles here, and these can then 
break down the antibiotic or inactivate the antibiotic so it's no longer effective, such as a beta-lactamase breaking down a beta-lactam antibiotic. So that's our first mechanism. Our second mechanism is the bacteria may alter the target site receptor for the antibiotic to reduce or block the binding of the antibiotic. So remember, a lot of these antibiotics work because they bind to something in the bacterium. They bind to some tar target site. For example, they might, bi might bind to a 50S ribosomal subunit, or they might bind to a 30S ribosomal subunit, or they might bind to a particular bacterial enzyme, like a transpeptidase or a DNA topoisomerase. And so that's how the drug works. It binds to a ribosomal subunit and blocks translation, or it binds to an enzyme and inactivates that enzyme. Well, bacteria may acquire new genes in the chromosome and plasmids that alter the molecular shape of the ribosomal subunit or alter the shape of the enzyme uh, to which the drug would normally bind, so the drug no longer binds. So bacteria often become resistant to the antibiotics we call macrolides by producing a slightly altered 50S ribosomal subunit. The ribosomal subunit still functions in translation, but it's been altered so the antibiotic can no longer bind to the ribosomal subunit. Uh, in the illustration here, we see that a normal ribosome at the bottom has a shape as part of its 50S subunit that the antibiotic up here would bind to. And when the antibiotic binds to the ribosome, uh, it would alter the shape of the ribosome so it doesn't function. But through mutation or through horizontal gene transfer, the bacteria may produce an altered 50S subunit like we see in the middle here, and that prevents the drug from binding, but the ribosome is still able to function. And bacteria may become resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics, like the penicillins, monobactam, cephalosporins, carbapenems, by producing an altered transpeptidase to which the antibiotic doesn't bind. So again, remember these drugs work because they bind to transpeptidase and prevent the peptide crosslinks from forming. But the bacteria may produce an altered transpeptidase that still functions, uh, but the site to where the antibiotic would bind has been altered so the drug can't bind to the transpeptidase enzyme any longer and doesn't inactivate it. So let's take a look at some animations on those. First of all, an altered ribosomal subunit, which prevents the drug from binding. So again, the bacterium has altered genes now or new genes, either because of changes in the chromosome through mutation or picking up plasmids uh, through horizontal gene transfer. And these are going to code for an altered ribosomal subunit. So remember, the antibiotic has to enter the bacterium and then bind, in this case, to the 50S ribosomal subunit. That would be the normal ribosome. And so when that happens, the, that alters the ribosome, that blocks translation, and that causes faulty protein synthesis in the bacteria. So that's what happens when the antibiotic works, as we saw in the previous soft shock lesson. But because of the new genes the bacteria has picked up through mutation or genetic recombination, it may produce an altered 50S subunit. Uh, which has a different shape by changing the order of the nucleotides and the ribosomal RNAs or the proteins. And so now when the antibiotic enters the bacterium, it can no longer bind to the 50S subunit. It doesn't alter the ribosome and the ribosome functions normally and the bacterium is now resistant to that antibiotic. And in the case of an altered enzyme, Remember, enzymes have an active site that the substrate binds to. In this case, if this was transpeptidase, that would allow the peptide crosslinks to form 
between the peptides coming off of the NAMs between the rows in peptidoglycan. But there's a shape on the enzyme that uh, antibiotics like penicillins and cephalosporins can bind to. So when the antibiotic is present, the antibiotic binds to the antibiotic binding site of the enzyme, such as transpeptidase, that changes the shape of the enzyme, which alters the active site, so the enzyme can no longer function. If that was transpeptidase, then it could no longer um, be able to um, make the peptide crosslinks in the peptidoglycan. So when the drug works, that's what happens. But now let's take a look at what happens uh, when the bacterium becomes resistant by producing an altered enzyme. So anyway, this is a normal one, first of all. When the drug does bind, that changes the active site, so the substrate can no longer bind, and the antibiotic is inactivating that enzyme. But again, what can happen is that through mutation or genetic recombination from horizontal gene transfer, the order of amino acids may change in the enzyme and alter this part of the enzyme where the antibiotic would normally bind. So now the antibiotic can no longer bind, but the active side of the enzyme hasn't been altered. It can still carry out its normal function. So again, another common mechanism of resistance is altering the target site for the antibiotic. In the case of an enzyme, alter the antibiotic binding site of the enzyme, but the active site hasn't been altered, so the enzyme can still function. Or in the case of a ribosome, producing an altered ribosomal subunit to which the drug can no longer bind. Our third mechanism, and a very common mechanism, is altering the membranes and transport systems to prevent entry of the antibiotic into the bacterium and or using an efflux pump to transport the antibiotic out of the bacterium. So there's a number of ways this can happen. And of course, one of the reasons we learned about the cell wall and active transport in the cytoplasmic membrane and all of that is so we could all eventually understand this. So for antibiotics that uh, target ribosomes or enzymes within the bacteria, of course, the bacteria first have to get through the porins in the outer membrane of its gram-negative or acid fast. Because remember, in bacteria that have an outer membrane, things have to cross the outer membrane first. And that's usually done through pores in the outer membrane produced by pore-forming proteins called porins. But as we'll see in an animation in a minute, by altering the porins, that can change the size of the pore. Because remember, those porins are proteins, and if you change the order of amino acids in those porins, then the shape may be altered, and that may create smaller pores that no longer let the drug in. Or there may be an alteration in regulation where fewer porins are made to transport the drug in. So that's something that would apply to gram-negative bacteria and acid-fast bacteria that have an outer membrane. Now, uh, once the drug passes through the outer membrane, or in gram positives where there is no outer membrane, then the drug has to be transported across the cytoplasmic membrane by active transport, which remember involves transport proteins and cellular energy. So a bacteria may block the entry of an antimicrobial drug by acquiring genes that alter the transport proteins used to transport the drug through the cytoplasmic membrane. Now, this is, isn't a real common mechanism of resistance, but it does occur occasionally. So the idea here is that the transport proteins in the cytoplasmic membrane are altered. They may no longer transport the drug into the bacteria. Much more commonly is that a bacteria may acquire genes coding for an energy-driven efflux pump in the cytoplasmic membrane. 
Now, this is a transport protein that uses active transport to actually pump the drug right back out of the bacterium so that it doesn't accumulate in high enough quantity to inhibit or kill the organism. And again, it's one of the most common methods bacteria use to prevent toxic levels of antimicrobial drugs from accumulating in the cytoplasm. Sometimes it may not uh, get rid of all the drug inside, but it reduces it to such a low level that the organism can eventually use other mechanisms to develop resistance to that drug. So everything works okay transporting the drug in, but now there's a new transport protein, an efflux pump that pumps it back out. And so let's take a look at animations of each of these three, starting with producing altered porins in the outer membrane to transport the, uh, prevent transport of the drug across the outer membrane, which we could see in gram-negative or acid-fast bacteria that have outer membranes, like we see here. So again, anything that's going to enter the cytoplasm, if it's a gram-negative or acid pass, has to first get through the outer membrane through pores, which act as a coarse molecular sieve, as we learned. Um, and these are made up of pore-forming proteins called porins. So by altering the porins, changing the size of the porin proteins, for example, uh, that could create smaller pores so that the drug can no longer get through the outer membrane. Alternately, the bacteria might produce an altered transport system to block transport of the drug across the cytoplasmic membrane. Now, again, this isn't real common, but it does occur occasionally, so we'll mention it. So again, in this case, the new genes in the plasmid or the change in genes in the chromosome uh, could produce an altered transport protein. Now, remember, for these antibiotics to enter the bacterium, they actually have to be transported across the cytoplasmic membrane by active transport. But by altering the transport protein, then that transport protein may no longer be able to transport the drug across the cytoplasmic membrane. But as we said, the most common mechanism is producing a new transport protein called an efflux pump that pumps the drug out of the bacterium. So again, uh, there are new genes the bacterium has picked up on plasmids or possibly through mutations in a chromosome. So everything works normally. The porins aren't altered. The transporter is not altered. The drug gets in okay. The target site's not altered. But in this case, a new transporter is made called an efflux pump and that uses energy to pick up the drug inside the bacteria and pump it out again. So here we see that the antibiotic enters the bacterium, but these efflux pumps pick the drug up and pump it back out again. Now again, typically they don't remove all of the drug, although if they were uh, sufficiently efficient enough and there were enough of them, they could conceivably do that but they reduce the concentration inside, and that allows the bacteria to stay alive longer, and then through mutation or other horizontal gene transfer, it may pick up other mechanisms of resistance as well. So that's the efflux pump, where a new transporter uses energy to pump the antibiotic out of the bacterium again. Some of these efflux pumps are narrow spectrum in that they might pick up a particular drug, like maybe just be able to pick up a penicillin and transport it out, or cephalosporin and transport it out. But what we're seeing much more commonly now are broad spectrum efflux pumps that we'll talk about a little later in this soft chop lesson. And these can often pump out a number of different antibiotics, not just one. And those are becoming a real problem in treating infectious diseases today, as we'll see later on in this unit. Uh, I find there's a little movie here that actually shows bacteria becoming resistant by picking up plasmids. Uh, this video kind of covers the whole screen. I'll try to play it a few times. 
so you can see it because uh, it's hard to reduce that and that happens pretty fast. But basically what we're looking at here is E. coli and the ones in green, fluorescing green, are resistant to tetracycline. The ones in red are not. But through horizontal gene transfer, plasmids can be transferred from resistant bacteria to susceptible bacteria. So again, in this particular video, the green are the resistant bacteria. And as a bacteria becomes more green, it becomes more resistant. The red are the susceptible bacteria that are sensitive to tetracycline. And the little orange dots you see are the plasmids that are transmitted. So we see the orange dots that are being picked up, and as the bacteria start turning green, they're becoming resistant. That one's kind of light green, but it's become a darker green as it becomes more resistant. So let's back that up and watch that one or two more times. So again, concentrate on the little orange dots and notice that as they, uh, the bacterium turns green, it's becoming more resistant as it picks up a plasmid coding for an efflux pump. Show it one more time. So you can watch for little orange dots and the bacteria starting to turn green. That's where they've picked up the plasmid coating for an efflux pump. That's pumping out enough antibiotic to keep it alive long enough that it eventually develops resistance uh, to tetracycline and becomes more and more resistant. So that is an example of altered porins, altered transport proteins in the cytoplasmic membrane or efflux pumps that pre either prevent the drug from entering the bacterium or pick up the drug inside the bacterium and pump it back out again. And our final mechanism is modulating gene expression to produce more of a bacterial enzyme that's being tied up or altered by the antibiotic. Now, of course, remember enzymes are catalysts and they are present in the cell in small amounts because they're not altered during their reaction. And organisms don't want to make more enzymes than they need for typical metabolism. Well, we've seen that a number of these antimicrobial drugs work because they inactivate the enzyme. And when they act inactivate the enzyme, they block that metabolic reaction like by altering transpeptidase, uh, they may no longer allow transpeptidase to form the peptide crosslinks needed to make the peptidoglycan strong. And again, remember, enzymes are present in limited amounts, and all of that's under genetic control. Sometimes that genetic control is at the transcription level. Uh, there are regulatory systems like operons that we didn't really talk about here. Uh, but what often turns on production of an enzyme is called induction, uh, where when the cell detects that it run, is running low on an enzyme or it needs a new enzyme because there's a new substrate present, that turns on uh, the gene that allows RNA polymerase to bind and then make that enzyme, transcribe that enzyme. In other cases, it works by repression, where when sufficient enzyme accumulates, that turns off uh, the portion of the gene that RNA polymerase binds to, and that stops the bacterium from making the enzyme. So sometimes the bacteria turn on enzyme production, sometimes they turn it off when there's enough of it. And that's, uh, uh, that's regulating enzyme production at the transcriptional level, whether RNA polymerase binds to messenger RNA and allows the enzyme to be made or not. And that regulates how much enzymes made so that, again, the cell can maintain pretty good homeostasis. Now, enzyme production can, is also regulated at the translational level. And this is done through small non-coding regulatory RNAs called microRNAs. Uh, we talked about these, uh, we'll talk about these a little bit later as well. But these microRNAs are complementary 
to an early portion of a messenger RNA coding for a particular enzyme. So these RNAs don't code for a protein, but rather they're complementary to a messenger RNA that does code for a protein. And so one of the ways that cells from bacteria to humans can shut down transcription of an enzyme, stop making more enzyme than it needs, is that it makes an antisense RNA like we see in figure eight that is complementary to this messenger RNA. Uracil pairing with adenine, adenine pairing with uracil, et cetera. And once that antisense RNA binds, that prevents ribosomes from attaching to the messenger RNA, and that blocks translation of the messenger RNA. So that would shut down enzyme production. So often when there's enough enzyme made, these micro RNAs are made and they block translation. So what can happen, all this is carefully regulated to make sure that a cell doesn't make more enzymes than it needs for normal metabolism. But if mutations occur in that regulation, then the bacteria wind up making more enzyme than they normally would. So mutations or horizontal gene transfer may modulate that gene expression. It may modulate the regulation of transcription so that enzymes are made even when they're not needed or the synthesis of enzymes is not turned off, so more enzymes made than needed. Or it may not produce the microRNAs and therefore the messenger RNA continues to be transcribed into enzyme. So by altering these mechanisms that regulate the amount of enzyme, the bacterium winds up making more enzyme than it normally would. But since enzymes, of course, are produced in limited amounts, by producing excessive amounts of enzyme could allow for the normal metabolic activity that's being blocked by the drug to still occur. So that's a pretty simple mechanism. Just make more of the enzyme that's being tied up. <coughs> and normally that would be a disadvantage to a bacterium, but in the presence of the drug, that's an advantage. And this is really affecting competitive antagonism that we had mentioned previously. So remember in competitive antagonism, the drug resembles, in blue, resembles a bacterial substrate. So either the substrate that the bacterium wants to use can bind to the bacterial enzyme and the bacterium would carry out the normal reaction or the drug can bind to the enzyme, but then that ties up the enzyme so that it won't bind to the normal substrate. So remember, enzymes are normally present in small amounts. So again, as long as uh, there isn't too much drug there, then the enzymes are still able to react with the substrate and make the end products. But typically what happens is that enough drug enters the bacterium, assuming of course that it can get through the membranes, et cetera. And so what's normally happening when the drug is working is that there's much more drug than there is enzyme or substrate. And so all the enzyme is tied up with the drug that blocks the active site so the substrate can't bind and that blocks that enzyme's chemical reaction. So that's what happens when the drug works. Uh, there's enough drug to tie up the limited amount of enzyme. So of course the key here is that by changing the gene, uh, modulating the gene's uh, production of enzyme either by modulating whether or not the messenger RNA is transcribed into enzyme or whether or not the messenger RNA is translated into enzyme, uh, the bacteria may make more of the limited enzyme as we see here. So when the drug is working, there's limited enzyme, all the drug binds to the enzyme, the enzyme is tied up, it can't carry out the normal reaction. But by changing uh, the level of enzyme production, by interfering with normal regulation of enzyme synthesis, the bacteria may now make excessive amounts of that enzyme. And now there's not enough drug to tie up all the enzyme. There's enough enzyme that allows the red substrate to bind and the normal chemical reaction can occur. So anytime a drug is tying up an enzyme, uh, one of the ways bacteria can become resistant is simply make more enzyme than it normally would by altering its normal regulatory processes that prevent it from normally making too much enzyme. But under the conditions of the drug being present, having too much enzyme is an advantage. <clears throat>
Now we also learned back in unit one that many pathogenic bacteria as well as many microbiota uh, form complex bacterial communities called biofilms. And we know that the bacteria in the biofilms can communicate with another, one another through quorum sensing, which allows them to function as a population of bacteria rather than as individual bacteria. So by living as a community of bacteria within a biofilm, that confers several advantages to bacteria. First of all, they're better able to resist attack by antibiotics, and they're better able to resist the host immune system. And there are several mechanisms we think that might allow for it to become more resistant to attack by antibiotics. First of all, that extracellular polycyclic matrix that forms the biofilm, that massive glycocalyx, uh, may make it more difficult for the antibiotic to diffuse in and actually reach the bacteria. Also, bacteria living in the biofilm are generally in a metabolic, more inert state. Uh, they replicate more slowly in a biofilm, but this could slow down the antibacterial action of the drug if the bacteria is replicating more slowly. And of course, many antibiotics are static, not cytal in action. They inhibit, they don't kill. So again, if they're inhibiting growth, but they're re uh, replicating more slowly and the drug is, isn't getting in as much, that again could be an advantage to the bacteria. And of course, the body depends on phagocytes to remove the inhibited bacteria, but the biofilm, of course, makes engulfment by phagocytes uh, very difficult, if not impossible. And that allows it to resist the host immune system as well. So biofilms by their very nature tend to make bacteria a little harder to treat. And a lot of times when there are surgical wound infections with implants being inserted where biofilms form, they do become very difficult to treat because we have biofilms growing at the surgical site. Now another mechanism of resistance that's a little bit different uh, is called antibiotic tolerance and bacteria that have antibiotic tolerance are called dormant persisters. So this is another mechanism that protects some bacteria from antibiotics. And again, we call that antibiotic tolerance where they tolerate the antibiotic. The tolerant bacterium is not killed, but simply stops growing when the antibiotic's present. So once they detect the drug, they simply stop replicating. But remember, antibiotics are interfering with replicating bacteria. So as long as the antibiotics not replicating, the drug can't do anything to harm the bacterium. And it just sits there in a dormant state until the drug's gone, and then it's able to start replicating again. Uh, this was first found in Streptococcus pneumoniae that was tolerant to vancomycin. And what the pneumococcus does is that when it detects vancomycin, it represses the autolysins that enables osmotic lysis when the drug's present. So remember, the autolysins break down the peptidoglycan so no new building blocks or peptidoglycan monomers can be inserted. But if uh, in the presence of vancomycin, the bacteria turn off their autolysins or repress their production, then it's not putting splits in the cell wall if the cell wall is not being weakened by autolysins, then it doesn't burst and the bacteria simply continue to live. So antibiotic tolerance is especially significant in bacteria that form biofilms associated with catheters, heart valves, orthopedic devices, there are people with cystic fibrosis. And these biofilms often contain small percentage of dormant persisters that are not divided but tolerating what antibiotics might be entering. And again, once the drug is gone, uh, because the person stops taking it, then these uh, tolerant bacteria are able to start dividing again and replenish the population. And of course, so those are our mechanisms then of antibiotic resistance, producing an enzyme that inactivates or alters the antibiotic, producing altered membrane systems so the drug either doesn't enter, such as with altered porins, or altered transport proteins, or where the drug is pumped back out again, such as with efflux pumps, producing altered uh, 
antibiotic target binding sites like altered ribosomal subunits or altered enzymes to which the drug can no longer bind, producing more of a limited enzyme, so there's no longer enough drug to tie up all the enzyme, or developing into a tolerant dormant persister that turns off replication once the antibiotic's detected and once the antibiotic's gone, starts replicating again. So there are fairly simple mechanisms of resistance that are all occurring because the bacterium has new altered genes from mutation or has picked up new genes or altered genes from horizontal gene transfer. Now, mutation is also a mechanism of resistance. We say horizontal gene transfer is faster because remember, uh, in a very quick time in one simple transfer, a number of genes can be directly transmitted from one bacterium to another, where a mutation is a rare event where you alter the function of maybe one particular gene. And most of those mutations are lethal in the bacteria that have the altered gene die. But occasionally a mutation results in an altered gene where that gene product provides an advantage to the bacterium, like maybe making an enzyme that can break down the antibiotic. But bacteria can actually improve their mutation rate. Uh, when bacteria are under stress from antibiotics, at least some bacteria switch on genes, and these gene products increase the mutation rate. Now, the normal mutation rate we mentioned was uh, maybe one out of every million to one out of every billion uh, base pair additions, there's a mistake made where the wrong base is put in or an extra base is added or base is deleted. So that's pretty rare. But what some bacteria can do is when they detect the antibiotics and uh, they switch on stress genes, and that increases the mutation rate to 10,000 times faster than normal. So they actually increase their mutation rate, which causes a hyper evolution, where that mutation acts as a self-defense mechanism for the entire bacterial population by increasing the chance of forming an antibiotic resistant mutant that's able to survive at the expense of the majority of the population. So remember by increasing the mutation rate, more and more of the bacteria in the population are gonna die because most mutations are harmful. But by having that very high rate of mutation uh, with hyperevolution, then uh, the mechanism is that that increases the chance that at least one of those bacteria in the population will get the right mutation that will allow it to survive the drug and replenish the population. And uh, we can see mutation actually occurring over time. This is an excellent video from Harvard Medical School that shows the evolution of E. coli antibiotic resistance over both space and time. And we're gonna play this, this very interesting little video showing mutation, how bacteria can become resistant at 10,000 times the level of antibiotic that it would normally be sensitive to. Sorry, it's taking a while to load in here. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up, is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally, the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, of course, the thin agar, that bacteria can move around it. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white 
first, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. Then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So that's a pretty good little movie there. I think I said 10,000 times, it was 1,000 times the amount of antibiotic. <clears throat> so that is a little bit about mutation as well. Now let's look at some examples of antibiotic resistance. So typically exposure to an antibiotic selects for strains of organisms that have become resistant to the natural processes of mutation and horizontal gene transfer. And the spread of antibiotic resistance uh, is due to both direct and indirect selection. Direct selection refers to selection of an antibiotic resistant pathogen at the site of an infection. So in other words, an antibiotic resistant bacteria enters the body, it's resistant to start with, and uh, resist that antibiotic. But what we often see is indirect selection. And this is a selection of antibiotic resistant microbiota or normal flora within an individual. Keep in mind, every time you take antibiotics, a lot of the microbiota that survive are antibiotic resistant microbiota. And at a later date, these resistant microbiota may transfer resistant genes to pathogens through horizontal gene transfer. And of course, these resistant normal flora, being normal microbiota, normal flora, can easily be transmitted from one person to another through fecal oral route or respiratory secretions. And of course, often that resistance is due to plasmids, such as the R plasmids in gram positives we mentioned, uh, or accumulating transposons for antibiotic resistance, or through conjugative transposons that code for uh, not only drug resistance, but the ability to form a mating pair. So this is usually through horizontal gene transfer. Now let's look at some examples of some bacteria that are increasing medical importance. That first article I showed you at the very beginning of the soft chalk lesson shows you a fair number of uh, pathogenic bacteria that are of real concern from critical to uh, significant to um, still a problem. And one example is antibiotic resistant Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Of the estimated 820,000 cases of gonorrhea infections each year in the United States, about 246,000 are antibiotic resistant. Uh, it's getting more and more difficult to treat this organism, which used to be pretty easy to treat uh, for the first few decades, we had antibiotics with penicillin, but then uh, penicillinase-producing Neisseria gonorrhoeae started evolving. They could break down the penicillin, so they switched drugs, and then the, the gonococci started becoming resistant to that, and this problem just continues today. Uh, this is the one that's probably the most scary right now, carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, or CRE. Now labs 12 and 13 that we'll be doing deal with the Enterobacteriaceae. And these are gram negative bacilli that include a lot of microbiota like Enterobacter, E. coli, uh, Proteus, Klebsiella, Serratia, 
and they also include some intestinal pathogens like salmonella. Well, this kind of started out when carbapenemase producing Klebsiella pneumoniae, one of the Enterobacteriaceae, uh, were being identified worldwide as a cause of hospital acquired or nosocomial infections. And carbapenemase is a broad spectrum beta lactamase. It uh, breaks down all the penicillins, all the cephalosporins, all the carbapenems, and the monobactams. So uh, some beta lactamases are highly specific, like they may break down just a penicillin or just a particular cephalosporin, but these are broad spectrum beta lactamases that are breaking down virtually all of the beta lactam antibiotics. So we often call these extended spectrum beta lactamases, ESBLs, extended spectrum beta lactamases. And although they're originally seen in Klebsiella pneumoniae, we're now starting to see them with increasing frequency in many other of the Enterobacteriaceae, including some of these we'll be dealing with in the lab, like Enterobacter, E. coli, Serratia, and Salmonella. So these expended spectrum beta lactamase producing Enterobacteriaceae are now being called carbapenem resistant Enterobacteria CREs. And these are especially bad if the bacteria get into the bloodstream. Remember one of the complications of uh, healthcare associated infections such as pneumonia, urinary tract infections, surgical wound infections, et cetera, is that the bacteria may get into the blood. And they're often caused by these Enterobacteriaceae. So about half of hospitalized patients who get a bloodstream infection with the CRE, the carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, die from the infection. And there are very few alternatives left to treat those. Uh, one that most people have heard of are methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA, sometimes called MRSA. And these are resistant to methicillin, which was a uh, penicillin that was resistant to beta-lactamase enzymes. Uh, but the MRSA uh, resists all the penicillins and all the cephalosporins. And they tend to be a little more virulent as well and require more hospitalization. Another big one we're concerned about are vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, VREs. Uh, we'll be taking up the staphylococcus back up in number three in lab uh, 15 and the enterococci in lab 14. So the enterococci are fecal strep that can get where they shouldn't be, causing urinary tract infections, surgical wound infections, and septicemia. And vancomycin-resistant enterococci uh, are intrinsically resistant to most antibiotics because they have low permeability membrane barriers, but they've acquired resistance to the first drug of choice against them, vancomycin. And there have been cases where there have been no effective antibiotics to treat a vancomycin-resistant enterococcus infection. But since that's transmitted through fecal contact being normal for the intestinal tract or direct contacts from a uh, seeping wound, proper uh, isolation can help reduce that organism from being spread. Uh, another concern are XDRTB, which stands for extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. Uh, still a relatively rare multi-drug resistant strain of mycobacterium tuberculosis that's resistant to almost all the drugs we have available to treat tuberculosis, including the two best first-line drugs, isoniazid and rifampin, as well as a number of common second-line medications and some of the common injectable drugs. And then, of course, another big problem uh, that we've mentioned a couple times in the semester is Clostridioides difficile infections, or C. diff. This was formerly known as Clostridium difficile, uh, but about a year and a half ago, they changed the genus name to Clostridioides. But in a 2015 report, when it was still named Clostridium, they found that Clostridium difficile caused about half a million infections among patients in the United States in a single year. That's a 2015 study, and an estimated 15,000 deaths 
And so that makes it a fairly common cause of infectious disease death in the United States with uh, very excessive medical costs associated with that. And again, as we mentioned, this is a problem where uh, people become colonized with uh, Clostridioides difficile. And if it's in its endospore form in the GI tract when the antibiotics given, since the endospores are dormant, they have no effect on the endospore. But the other bacteria that live in the intestinal tract, the microbiota, are killed by the antibiotic. And then if the person stops taking the drug and the endospore germinates before the microbiota grows back, there's no competitive antagonism. Uh, the, you don't have the normal flora that normally inhibits the Clostridioides from growing. So the Clostridioides difficile overgrows the area, produces some nasty toxins we'll learn about in unit three, and um, can cause uh, extreme and even fatal diarrhea and death. So this is a real problem. We'll talk a little bit more about this in unit three when we get into bacterial pathogenicity, but it is the most common healthcare associated gastrointestinal infection in the United States. And again, this number, these numbers we're talking about here are people just taking antibiotics for some routine medical procedure or being prescribed antibiotics when they're not really needed. So again, uh, a lot of these bacteria we're learning about in a lab, especially bacteria like E. coli, Proteus, Enterobacter, Serratius, Pseudomonas, Staphylococci, Enterococci, these are leading causes of healthcare associated infections in the United States. And this is a quote from uh, CDC from their healthcare associated infection website. In American hospitals alone, Healthcare associated infections count for an estimated 1.7 million infections and 99,000 associated deaths a year in the United States. And they also, now that's in the hospital. They also estimate that more than 2 million people in the United States get infections resistant to antibiotics, and at least 23,000 people die as a result. So again, the problem of misuse of antibiotics is a real problem, uh, both in cost and in morbidity and mortality. And of course, keep in mind that bacterial endospores being dormant resistant survival spores, such as produced by the genus Bacillus and Clostridium and Clostridioides, are naturally resistant to antibiotics, most disinfectants, and most physical agents. So the endospore form itself is highly resistant. And although the endospores are harmless, they do allow some bacteria to be transmitted to humans, as in the case of anthrax, tetanus, botulism, gas gangrene, and C. diff infections called pseudomembranous colitis. So that's our little look at how bacteria become resistant to our control agents, such as antibiotics, and some of the problems that occur because of the misuse of antibiotics. And here's a self quiz you can do that covers the whole soft chalk lesson. And that ends unit two.